Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Nathaniel Harmon, CEO and founder of Blockchain Solutions Hawaii. Nate is working on ocean technology that energizes and monetizes ocean thermals with Bitcoin. This is one of the more bleeding edge conversations we've had on the podcast, so be sure to stick around. This podcast is presented ad-free by Compass Mining, the largest marketplace for Bitcoin mining. Check out compassmining.io today if you want to buy, sell, or host an ASIC. And now, onto the show. Nate, thanks for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate your time. And uh, when this came across my Twitter feed, I was pretty jazzed about it. We get some interesting Bitcoin miners on the podcast for sure, lots of different personalities, but we're mostly talking about your standard energy sources, whether that be stranded gas or grid, or maybe even some nuclear guys here and there. But we don't have what you have, which is all this oceaneering information, which I guess like we talked about like last week on our phone call. Uh, it's pretty in depth. And I, I think a lot of people who are going to be listening to this podcast are going to learn at least a few new things today. So thanks again for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. Cool. So we'll just start off from the top. And again, like, please correct my misused terms, whether that <laughs> it's going to happen a few times during the podcast. So please just correct me right off the bat. I won't, I won't take it personally. Uh, but we'll start with your background, how you got into engineering, oceanography, uh, and, and just like your, your general background within that space before turning to Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. So I guess in a different life, I was a, um, a scuba instructor and uh, I was working in the Florida Keys for a while. And, you know, I witnessed um, a bunch of coral bleaching events. And then I moved with my wife from the Keys out here to Hawaii for, again, scuba diving uh, and then started to see a lot of the same things that I had seen in the Keys and around that time, I got into Bitcoin and I was able to quit my job as a scuba instructor and uh, go do pursue an undergraduate education at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Uh, and from there, um, it was in a global environmental science, essentially oceanography degree. Um, and then from there, I went on uh, They you know, they liked what I was doing, my research, my undergrad research. I just continued on into my graduate education as a marine geochemist and a marine geologist. I did not know you're into scuba. I should have assumed that since like, that's like your, your whole background. But uh, as a one aspiring scuba enthusiast to another, that's, that's pretty awesome to hear. Tell me about your, your Bitcoin and academic background, because we, we've seen a lot of this happening in the last two years where academics are becoming much more interested in Bitcoin. They're realizing that there's much more nuance to the conversation than they were allowing themselves to believe at first. And so they're, they're definitely starting to eke into Bitcoin, let alone also Bitcoin Twitter. It's been cool to see that happening, but get your background, be, uh, be good. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, early on, I got into Bitcoin. Um, and then through my graduate education, I built for you know, lack of a better term, chemistry robots in the ocean, um, and uh, you know, building those entailed uh, a lot of programming. Um, and I had been into Bitcoin for some time at that point, and you know, decided to see what the there there was. Right, uh, so I you know taught myself at C plus uh, plus, so I could read the core repository uh, and figure out, you know, whether it was a scam or not. And um, turns out it wasn't. And a lot of what I was seeing um, kind of fit the bill for a lot of things that I had been, you know, hearing about the, um, you know, the, the climate change. Um, And, you know, I, I, I saw that the proof of work provided this incentive or renewable energy that just simply hadn't been there, and that the, you know, the over the over over time, the uh, hash rate would gravitate naturally to renewable energy as the marginal cost of that renewable energy can effectively go to zero. You know, it costs nothing for the sun to shine, or the wind to blow, or for the geo to therm. So, you know, uh, versus, you know, say fossil fuels, which is going to be OPEX intensive, it doesn't cost much to build a coal plant. Um, But over the lifetime of that coal infrastructure, 
you're going to spend more on fossil fuels than you are building it where whereas you know renewables are the opposite they're really capex intensive but their opex is really low um and so i ended up writing this paper um and shopping it around to uh the soest school uh in the economics department um in amongst my uh professors uh including uh mora uh camilo dr camilo mora who wrote the famous mora et al paper that greenpeace is touting um and what a lot of people don't know is that in fact mora did not write that paper um and neither did katie talladay who is a close friend of mine um it was actually written by an undergraduate class and it's two pages long uh and that's not really known in the conversation so you know greenpeace and brad garlinghouse are out there touting a paper written by undergraduates that doesn't even describe the Bitcoin network. Um, and so, you know, from there, essentially people wrote me off. Uh, nobody really wanted to talk about um, what I what I described as the, the third industrial revolution, which is kind of a riff on Jeremy Rifkin's third industrial revolution. Uh, an industrial revolution, according to Jeremy Rifkin, requires the confluence of three separate technologies, a uh, an energy source, a communication technology, and a transport technology, and they all kind of work together. So, you know, you can think of this like coal and steam power uh, and the steam engine and the telegraph uh, for the first industrial revolution or petroleum, the internal combustion engine and the, uh, you know, telephone, television, radio in the second industrial revolution. And um, Rifkin describes the third industrial revolution as the confluence of obviously renewable energy as the energy source, um, the internet, pretty obvious as the communication technology. And then he, his, his transport technology is, is drones. Um, and it relies on a couple of uh, n- not, you know, not accurate facts. Uh, he says, you know, oh, full self-driving is right around the corner. Well, you know, Elon's been promising that for uh, how many years now? Every year. Oh, it's it's happening next year. Uh, and it's still not. And it's nowhere close. Full self-driving is not going to happen. And to be honest, the savings from a drone powered uh ship are, are it, it's 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 a rounding error uh you know the the crew which you're still going to have to have the crew even if it is self driving which we have autopilot already um so you're not going to get a huge increase there uh most drone delivery programs are being shut down um because they're just not profitable and there's very little uh, they can't service my area um one too windy to uh, restricted flying zone um because there's military bases everywhere in hawaii um and so what i posited in this paper that i was shopping around is that bitcoin is that transport technology it takes the renewable energy from where it is converts it to monetary energy and transports it via the internet to wherever it needs to go at the speed of light. You know, it's uh, it's an order of magnitude um, more efficient than the current financial system. I, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir on that one. Um, <clears throat> but it's, you know, it, it is that transport technology, that component. And you can't blame Rifkin for not seeing that. It was, he published in 2013. So he was... Um, working on that book uh, and that theory way before anyone realistically was getting into the nitty gritty about Bitcoin. So, you know, I, I, I wrote the paper, shopped it around, very little interest. Uh, in fact, I, I got a lot of pushback from it. Um, I was told that I was a scammer and that I was, uh, I should go work for the Winklevoss twins. I should drop out of school because I can't read. I'm illiterate. Uh, and they would send me, you know, the Digi Economist, and they would send me. I'd be, like, well, you know, I I know this paper. I I may have influenced this paper by talking to the all of the authors about Bitcoin, who then floated it as an idea to this undergrad class, who over the course of a semester, you know, learns about a subject, studies a subject, writes a paper, learns about the publishing process. It's 
it's more of an, in, you know, uh, an introduction for these undergrads into the publishing process rather than producing actual scientific um, knowledge. And now it, you know, it's two pages long. The network they describe, even though Bitcoin is in the title, the network they describe doesn't reflect the Bitcoin network. And it's not to say that their math isn't wrong. Uh, their math is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, they did a fair job with the statistics and modeling, but um, any model is only as good as its initial conditions. And the initial conditions that they describe just simply don't reflect the Bitcoin network. Tell me about Blockchain Solutions Hawaii and what you guys are, are up to there. And then we'll dive into the energy conversation as well, which I think is probably what most of our listeners are really keen on hearing about. Yeah, so Ocean, um, our Blockchain Solutions Hawaii was a, or is a, uh, you know, a small company that I founded a while ago. Um, mostly we do side chain work. You know, there wasn't a lot of need for, you know, Bitcoin based industry in Hawaii at the time. So, you know, a little bit of there, but I, you know, it afforded me, uh, you know, enough of a salary that I could continue, you know, not getting a job. I didn't have to get a job. I didn't have to. Um, and so I'd started developing this theory more and more and more um, throughout the last years at undergrad and then on through BSH. Um, and now, uh, one of the things that I'd been working on was that theory, the third industrial revolution, and then tying that to Hawaii's energy transition. Um, and uh, what, what I found was that Hawaii, you know, Hawaii has this goal of 100% renewable energy by 2045. So I looked around and said, you know, how are we actually going to get there? Realistically, how do we get there? Um, and, you know, everybody says, oh, you're in, you're, you're in sunny Hawaii, right? You just use solar. Well, turns out that solar won't work. Uh, solar is not a base load. And, you know, there's a lot of um, interest in the different energy grids around the country, you know, ERCOT, Texas. Um, but Hawaii has its, not only is Hawaii separate, a separate grid from the rest of the mainland, each individual island is its own self-contained grid. Um, and so there is no, you know, exporting energy to your neighbor. There is no buying energy from your neighbor. We have to do it internally. Uh, we pay 30 cents per kilowatt hour now. Um, and I have, I actually have PV on my roof. Uh, it saves me quite a, quite a bit of money on energy costs. I can run the AC all day. Um, but you know, so solar, essentially, if we wanted to replace a single one of our power plants that provides a third of our energy, we would need a, a, a PV farm about four times the size of the international airport. And there's no room to build extra housing. We have a housing crisis. Uh, so we're not going to find four, you know, four uh, international airports on the island of Oahu. Uh, I looked at wind and to do the same, you know, replace that same power plant, you would need a offshore wind farm the size of Oahu itself uh, and boring. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so just they're non-starters. You know, they're not... Um, they're not base. They're not firm base base load, and so you, of course you need you know billions of dollars of batteries, and you have to replace all the PV panels, all the batteries, you know every every so often, um, and then you have to redo the entire grid. Uh, it, it's just a non-starter from a, a economic standpoint, and you know everybody knows Hawaii has volcanoes, right? You see it all the time. Oh, the volcano in Hawaii is going off. Um, so you say you think geo well like i said the the islands are disconnected from each other and you know while the big island may have geothermal uh oahu which is the main population center um in honolulu which is the city of honolulu is on the island of oahu where 1 million of the 1.4 million people in the state live uh has no geo um so there's really no way to exploit that geo on the big island to help Hawaii, help Oahu. And even if we could, there would be the political palatability of that is just it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, you know, they're they're mad enough about geo existing on the big island in the first place. And then when you start trying to power Oahu from a neighbor island, that's that's a no go. We there's a lot of animosity between um 
Honolulu and the Outer Islands. Um, and so I went down the list, you know, nuclear, there's no sighting for nuclear in the state of Hawaii. Uh, you know, nuclear is a, a great option for a lot of places, but the sighting is a, is, is a real issue. Um, you know, you have to be at the coast. Check, we have the coast. But you have to be away from major population centers. And we just simply don't have that land. Uh, there's nowhere, there's no uh, evacuation zones where a million people on an island, you're not going to be able to evacuate in case of, you know, say, a tsunami, which is a thing that we get here. Um, and hurricanes, uh, you know, so if there was a Fukushima level disaster, uh, we would be in big trouble if we had nuclear. So, I, you know, nuclear works other places, um, but like most renewable energy, if you consider nuclear renewable, which in general I do, um, it's, you know, not all renewable energy is available everywhere. Um, and nuclear just isn't available here. So I'm going down the list, and uh, it turns out that there is one renewable base load that's available for the entire state of Hawaii and could reliably power the state of Hawaii way more than 100%, and it's called Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. And um, it works by, just like geothermal, uh, it's essentially geothermal for the ocean, but Instead of, you know, having to mine down in, you know, dig, uh, dig wells down deep, what you can do is you take the temperature differential from the surface ocean in the tropics where it's nice and warm. Uh, I never have to wear a wetsuit here. You know, even on the coldest, windiest day when I go surfing before the sun rises, I'm not wearing a, um, not wearing a wetsuit. Uh, you take the warm surface water and then you pump up deep cold water from about a thousand meters deep, which is around five degrees C, and uh, you can run a heat engine on that. Um, and it's, uh, it turns out that this technology has been around for about 150 years. Um, and yeah, that's, and so that's what we're doing now with uh, our new company, Ocean Bit Energy. So describe to me the, the engine process, because I have a few questions just based on that itself. So I'm assuming you need some sort of fossil fuel engine to get the whole process started, maybe just for the pump. Maybe you can turn it off after that. And then like the cold water itself, how does that provide enough locomotion for an engine or to provide enough energy to, to run something else? Like where is the, the, the thermal power going in a sense? Yeah, so of course, you know, you're pumping deep water up, so you have to kickstart it, right? And you're going to need some fossil fuel, you need some energy source, whether that's solar or wind, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's energy agnostic. You just have to get the pump started. And uh, once you start pumping that deep water up, you can uh, run a Rankin cycle with ammonia as the working fluid. So, you know, ammonia evaporates at room temperature. And it uh, condenses at uh, above freezing. So, you know, you just evaporate the ammonia with the warm surface water and you run it through a turbine and then you condense it with uh, the cold water supply. And you're just generating, you get net power from that. Um, just temperature differential, right? And uh, yeah, that's it, it, it's it, it's really really not very complicated. It's not nuclear. Um, you know, it's even simpler than uh, the engine in your car. Uh, and you know, it, the temperature differential isn't that high, but you you make up for that with volume, right? The the ocean is is very very large. So you know, we're talking anywhere from a three meter pipe to a twelve meter pipe. Uh, depending on how much energy you want to get out. Um, it's not very efficient because the temperature differential isn't there, but you make up with that uh, for that with just sheer volume, you know, at, at the scale of 100 to 400 megawatts for one of these, you know, larger facilities, you're talking about a Niagara amount of water, uh, you know, Niagara Falls, which is, if you've ever been there, it's an, it's an incredible amount of water, but um yeah, so <laughs> it's it's okay. a lot of water. <laughs> no, that's helpful for I'm trying to like picture this because it's like not uh, I'm from Colorado, landlocked state. We don't have that much water, so it's like weird to like think about what this would would look like. 
Uh, I know previously in another conversation we had, you talked about how designing these things specifically for Bitcoin mining, and we can get to that conversation in a second, but designing these things takes in a, a few different considerations. So one thing you mentioned was you're trying to pipe up this cold water from the depths of the ocean. The easiest way to do it is a straight line between point A and point B, but sometimes you need a landmass, so your line is a little skewed. Uh, but other times you can float things and then you just pop it right up to the surface of the ocean that way. Like Traditionally, how do we see these sort of things deployed or are they necessarily deployed uh, all around Hawaii or, or other places? Um, so, yeah, it's uh, like I said, it's a technology that's been around for 150 years. There have been a number of plants that have been built in the past. Um, there's one here on the big island of, of Hawaii. Uh, at uh, Nelha, uh, the Natural Energy Laboratory of Hawaii. And um, it was a 100 kW uh, testing facility. And, you know, it's a land-based. So there's two, like you said, there's two designs. There is land-based, and then there is a offshore floating facility, uh, moored, uh, moored, floating facility that you, you know, have a single cable running back to land a power cable. Um, and, you know, there's design trade-offs for both, uh, you know, land-based, you have land use issues. Um, again, like you said, the pipe is going to be a lot longer. You have to get down to a thousand meters. So you have, you know, that slope um, versus if you, uh, you know, moor it offshore, here in Hawaii, it's about 10 kilometers offshore. You can moor it and uh, just run the pipe straight down. And, you know, the piping obviously costs the the, lar the longer it runs, the larger it is. And if it's on land, there's environmental impact because you're going to have to lay it over, you know, coral reefs, uh, protected, you know, marine areas. So there's considerations there. Um but yeah, the the offshore one is, uh, you know, w once you start getting to scale, it makes a lot of sense to moor them offshore. Um, and there have been a number of plants built uh, over the last hundred years. I think the first one was built in the early 1900s. Uh, one was built in 1935. And uh, one of the big problems with these things is that well, they're in the, you know, the tropics. So you have hurricanes. And I think both of those were destroyed by hurricanes. Um, they were land-based and they were destroyed by hurricanes. And then there, you know, there was a push to rebuild the one in 1935, but then 1938 happened and we discovered oil in the Middle East, the largest deposit on, on earth. And that, um, it kind of killed all renewable energy uh, experiments uh, almost overnight, um, you know, when they found cheap fossil fuels. Uh, and so now there's um, there's talk about building one in San Tome, uh, one, a 1 1.5 megawatt uh, plant in San Tome. There was a one megawatt demonstration facility built here on Oahu back in the 90s. Um, but, you know, for the most part, for the last you know, since the, the 30s, all OTEC has been experimental, um, just mm. testing, uh, because like most renewable energy, it is a economy of scale. So the smaller you build, the more expensive it is. And in order to build the large ones, which, you know, you're getting down to, you know, six cents or below per kilowatt hour, you have to build in the middle. And this is what's called the innovation valley of death. And it's been the, you know, the economic problem that has always plagued OTEC. You know, we know it works at, uh, you know, we know that the, in general, the Rankin cycle scales, scales up really well. Um, and we know that we can do it, you know, at a small, small range. But the problem has been, how do you build in the somewhere in the five to 20 megawatt range? and have it generate capital because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hooking it up to land, you're looking at costs of 50 cents per kilowatt hour or above, which is, that's a non-starter. Uh, you know, no one's going to buy that energy. 
So it has essentially been, oh, you know, you can spend a couple hundred million dollars, build one of these things uh, with off the shelf, commercially available, um, you know, material and essentially just take a, a bath on it. But just to mm -hmm. prove out the technology uh, and nobody's been willing to make that bet. Um, yeah. And that's kind of where I came in. Um, yeah. I floated the idea. <laughs> pardon nice. the pun that uh, bitcoin <laughs> bitcoin solves a lot of these problems getting us through that innovation valley of death um because uh one a lot of the you know a lot of that capex for one of these five say five to 20 megawatt uh power plants comes from connecting it to land um you have the power cable itself 10 kilometers of, of uh, you know, cabling is going to run you anywhere from 40 to $100 million. Um, if you don't connect it to land, you save that, right? Uh, if it's not connected to land, well, now you don't need to moor it. If there's no mooring, you don't have the, um, you know, and it's just floating, you know, moorings cost tens of millions of dollars to install, there's all sorts of permitting involved because uh, you're, you know, mooring something outside. Uh, you're mooring something to the bottom of the ocean. And if it's not moored, there's no reason to necessarily have it in Hawaii. Hawaii is at 21 degrees north and OTEC works from 23 degrees south to 23 degrees north. So we're at the, you know, the outer limits of where OTEC works. And because this is a heat engine, it works based on the temperature differential. So, you know, here in Hawaii, we have about a 20 degree C temperature differential all year round. And, but you can find higher. Uh, there are blobs of the ocean that are around 32 degrees Celsius. So five degree, you know, that's a 27 degree, um, you know, temperature differential. So you're increasing the efficiency of the energy generation if you go to the that blob, but that blob happens to be in the middle of the ocean at the equator. Um, one of the good things is that if you build at the equator, you don't have to worry about hurricanes. So, you know, whereas a lot of the cost of uh, these facilities in the past was hurricane proofing and they kept getting destroyed by hurricanes, um, well, you don't have that problem at the equator. But the problem has been who buys your energy in the middle of the ocean? I, there's never been a energy consumer in the middle of the ocean. You know, fishermen need energy, but not that much. Um, they're not going to come get it. So who who buys that energy? And the answer is, of course, Bitcoin. The Bitcoin network is the buyer there, which is which is pretty cool. So I'm trying to picture what this would look like. To me, it's just a barge. They float out somewhere and it'd have a bunch of containers on it. ASICs, just like we see with stranded gas or other facilities or in remote areas. You have a satellite beaming up and down blocks, and then you have the thermal engine on there too. So how would how would that picture like give me an engineering perspective or a schematic of what this would look like and how you would deploy it? I mean, that's exactly right. It's a bunch of uh containers C fastened to uh to a barge and you tug tow it out to the middle of the ocean um and then once you're out there you drop a uh you drop a giant pipe essentially a straw over the over the side of the barge um just and then you start running the uh the pumps um once you start running the pumps you can start generating energy and what you can do is you can um, you can actually use the, uh, you know, there's a lot of water, so there's a lot of wastewater. What you can do is you can use that wastewater, which is five degrees Celsius for cooling the miners. Uh, so you cool the ASICs included with the energy, you know, there's no extra cost for cooling the, uh, miners. So obviously we're, we're looking at, um, immersion mining. Uh, we can, you know, we can get the PUE, the uh, power use efficiency of one of these systems down to one. So 100% of the energy that's being generated is just going straight to Bitcoin mining. There's no other considerations. And then even more so, um, 
you can use the outflow of that cold water supply for dynamic positioning. So you're not burning, um, you know, fossil fuels to move the vessel because, you know, as the sun, as the earth go, travels around the sun, uh, that heat blob moves north and south depending on, you know, where, where we are during the year, right? Is the northern hemisphere tilted to the sun or is the southern hemisphere tilted to the sun? Um, and you can just track that heat blob year around because you're not tethered to anything. And you can use the outflow of the cold water to do that. And then even further use for that cold water is that the way that the uh, global ocean currents work, uh, there's the thermohaline circulation, which uh, transports heat around the world. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, you know it as the Gulf Stream. Uh, it's why it's warm at the um, it's warm on the East Coast and you know, it's cold on the West Coast, right? You know, you know even in the summer, it's, it's really cold water on the West Coast of uh, the U.S. Um, and so as that water travels around, it also sinks down deep. And uh, as it's traveling underneath, you know, not at the surface, right? The ocean's pretty deep and there's multiple uh, bodies of water and they all travel around the world. Um, it accumulates detritus from that rains down from above. So nutrients, essentially nutrients rain down and they accumulate in these undersea currents. And so as we pull that cold nutrient dense water up, if we release it at the surface, you can generate primary production. So, you know, little tiny microscopic plants, uh, you know, phytoplankton, you can stimulate them to do what plants do best suck carbon out of the atmosphere and then when they die they rain back down into those deep ocean currents so you can tie the cold water supply into three things cooling the miners moving the ship and then carbon capture and storage um and this has been the you know the missing piece right uh for otec for the longest time People have been trying to pair, you know, multiple processes in to OTEC to make it um, to make it financially viable. So they've explored hydrogen production, ammonia production, uh, desalination, um, but those all have uh, efficiency losses, right? Uh, doing all of those have efficiency losses versus what we're doing. It is as efficient as possible, and so. It, by this, we found, we figured out that we can actually make this financially viable. Um, you know, even at the the ten to twenty megawatt, five to twenty megawatt scale, we're looking at you know uh, somewhere in the range of ten cents per kilowatt hour, which is expensive in general for mining. You know, if you're used to hydro at four cents, but with a PUE of zero of one. This makes it, uh, you know, you're looking at an ROI where traditionally you've had a complete financial loss. Um, so it's not the, you know, at that, that middle scale, it's not the most efficient yet. But then once you, if, if we build this 10 megawatt uh, containerized grazing platform um, and, and run it for a certain amount of time, you know, say two, 2.5 years, you prove it prove it out, prove the technology out at sufficient scale, and then you can start building 100 megawatt, 100 to 400 megawatt platforms. Uh, and these can then, of course, power large, large metropolises around the world. Uh, there's about a billion people on planet Earth that can use this energy source. Um, and, you know, at that scale, you're not really worried about hurricanes as much. Uh, you know, the oil platforms do just fine, right? It's the small stuff. You know, the, the smaller you are, the more vulnerable you are to the hurricanes. And uh, but the larger you are. Stops mattering as much, you know, they're uh, shell. They do a pretty good job. Um, and that's you know, that's the end goal is 100 megawatt OTEC. Uh, it's there's an entire ocean of energy that nobody is talking about. Um, you know, it's anywhere from two to four terawatts of energy are available through OTEC alone. And uh, I mean, if you build a hundred megawatt uh, floating grazing platform, just like the 10 megawatt, you're looking at 
sub four cents um, for energy cost, you know, per kilowatt. And again, the cooling is still included. And as is the carbon capture and storage. So there's, you know, car, you can sell carbon credits or some bullshit. Um, I mean, it's, uh, and if you start pushing it past four terawatts of, you know, total supply, you start actually cooling the ocean, which may be, uh, you know, necessary in the future. Um, you know, cooling the surface as temperatures start to hit ramp up, uh, cooling the surface ocean may be something, uh, I'm not a huge fan of geoengineering, but, um, Mm -hmm. it, it may end up being something we actually have to do. And, this could theoretically uh, cool the ocean. And then there, uh, even more, there are um, trillions of dollars of rare earth minerals uh, contained in these um, manganese nodules. Um, they're essentially these balls of metal uh, that are just sitting on the, the, uh, the ocean floor, exposed. Uh, they're not buried. Uh, they're balls of metal, you know, the size of a head of lettuce. And there Wait, are. Can we back up a second? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's re- it's so <laughs> what ridiculous. Are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Manganese <laughs> nodules. Um, <laughs> there are millions of square kilometers that are littered with big balls of metal. They're manganese, cobalt, um, copper, nickel, iron, rare earths lithium um and there's trillions of dollars worth of these minerals and there's more uh there are more reserves of these minerals in these these regions these balls of metal sitting on the bottom of the ocean uh than there are available terrestrially um and one of the big problems of going to get them is energy source you know that's a you have to essentially build the fancy version of a vacuum and uh, you have to suck these balls of metal <laughs> from 4,500 meters below the surface. I, and it sounds it sounds so ridiculous, but <laughs> it sounds like a Looney Tune or something. It's it's crazy. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, mining Bitcoin in the middle of the ocean is totally rational, right? Um, <laughs> For this no, the show, ocean, it's, it's cool, but the ocean what you're is describing, yeah. The ocean is this incredible source. Uh, I mean, it's the you know the source of all life. Um, and the reason why these, you know, you ask yourself, why are there these big balls of metal on the, on the bottom of the ocean? Um, well, there's no inputs from above. So they're in, um, they're in essentially a, a giant ocean desert, right? Uh, the, you know, the Sahara equivalent of the ocean. So there's no, and the bottom, you know, the, the, the seafloor, uh, there's different types of, uh, compositions, but the composition of the seafloor is dependent on the inputs from above. And because these are in essentially the um, the ocean desert, uh, there there's no inputs from above. So the only thing that's happening is you get this accumulation over time of the metals that are just floating around the ocean. So it takes, I think, it takes about uh, ten million years for each centimeter for e- these balls to grow a single centimeter. So they've been around for you know sitting on the bottom of the ocean floor. For a hundred million years, um, mm-hmm. with no inputs, because normally these, you know, these these metals are still present. You know, when you, you know, when you're looking at mud, or you know, silty, or uh, you know, coral-based um, substrates, they're just buried underneath everything else. But because there's nothing to bury them, they just accumulate slowly. I mean, I don't know if you have your if you're able to look it up, but. If you look up manganese nodules and pull them up, you're going to see these big balls of freaking metal. <laughs> I might it's, just do it right now. It's so ridiculous, but um, no, it's one of the the many wonders of the ocean. And you know, the the mining rights uh, have already been sold off. You know, this has been something we've known about since the '60s. Actually, work from the University of Hawaii helped discover these things. Uh, we got a we we got a building built because of the discovery of all of this. Um, okay, we'll have to get an image up for the for the for the YouTube channel because this is it's weird looking. It's not exactly how I imagined it. It makes more sense now. But yeah, what I yeah, was yeah, imagining yeah. was <laughs> <laughs> what I was imagining was like very different from this. But, but they're, they're balls of metal. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> and one of the major problems with getting him is that is the power supply in the middle of the ocean. And it turns out that mm-hmm. the four major regions for these manganese nodules uh, all happen to be in the OTEC region. Um, and mm. if we want to, you know, if we want to lean on solar, if we want to lean on intermittent sources of energy, which we're going to have to, uh, the question is whether. You know, do we continue to do business with the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, mm-hmm. where, you know, cobalt, their major cobalt um, region? Do we continue to destroy the Congolese desert, right? Do yeah. we, or not desert, the uh, rainforest? Do we continue to strip mine the rainforest and, you know, use slave labor? Or do we go pick up these balls of metal that are just sitting on the bottom of the floor and, um, You know, we're going to it's not a matter of if we go get them. It's a matter of when. And, you know, they have variable power needs out in the middle of the ocean uh, when they're mining these um, nodules. And Bitcoin provides that demand response. So you have the OTEC system powering, you know, once they're out there powering, using it for dynamic positioning. And then you have Bitcoin mining, sucking it up. So there is another energy consumer out there, but we have to get to that scale first. Yeah, and that's and so we have to do a hundred percent Bitcoin mining um, operation, about ten to ten megawatts is what we're looking at. Yeah, how we put a bow on this part of the conversation. So Bitcoin mining operates as a monetization tool for for getting this off the ground. Stranded or energy. Stranded energy. That's right, and then it it also operates as a user of this energy when you're not vacuuming up all this all these nodules off the the seafloor is that right yeah it's uh you know because the pue is is one a lot of the regions that can use otec also have access to solar and wind and so what you do is you know in order to do the you know the the calculus on whether you should build a new solar farm or wind farm you know you have to it, it becomes much easier if you can essentially sell 100% of that energy you don't know when it's going to come but if you know that you can sell it, so you centralize that curtailment, you know, the waste energy to the OTEC plant, uh, you know, if it's connected to shore, uh, you know, like a large one connected to shore, yeah. you centralize that curtailment to the OTEC plant so that everybody is guaranteeing 100% of their energy being used. And of course, OTEC is the most efficient way to produce Bitcoin. This is this is wild. This whole conversation. I'm gonna be like deep on Wikipedia tonight, <laughs> looking at manganese nodules, which might be my favorite new phrase that I've come across. It's the ocean, man. The ocean, you know, <laughs> and just not there's you know, where everybody's talking about space. They're like, oh, let's go mine, let's go mine asteroids. <laughs> we are a hundred years away from that. We have to go to the ocean. We we have to go to the ocean before we even start thinking about space. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know it, these nodule and there's of course environmental you know issues with um, with OTEC, uh, but it's you know net net negative carbon. Um, there's some there's some um, there's a question about the noise and noise at sound attenuation. Um, mm-hmm. There's some issues with um you know obviously if you if you have a moored facility and you're releasing a bunch of nutrients you can get eutrophication uh so you if it's moored you really don't want to release all those Mm -hmm. nutrients at the surface but if you're moving around that's not really an issue and a lot of these you know environmental issues get cleared up when we start building it you know the 10 megawatt uh 10 megawatt size do a lot of research yeah Yeah. okay that well i kind of cleared up the last question I had for you was the downsides of this, the hidden costs that we might not know about. Maybe there's some more we can get into for a second. And then what scaling looks like for Bitcoin mining, especially because I haven't heard of anybody else doing this. And I'm wondering from your personal experience, if you're raising f- funds for this, how you're like pitching it to people or how you're e- expressing this. Because you, like you said, it's, a, it's an older technology. It's over 100 years old bringing the Bitcoin component to it and you can monetize it and and get through that death zone as you, as you say it. So what does it look like to address those downsides is probably a a better way of framing my question. 
So yeah, we're we are raising. Uh, we're going through a seed round uh, starting in uh, June one. Um, and our first thing we want to do is we want to uh, the the hundred kW plant here on the Big Island in Hawaii. It's actually been mothballed for about three years. Um, they it was mostly built for testing heat exchangers. So. Uh, our partner, Makai Ocean Engineering, who built the plant, um, they, you know, OTEC uh, development hadn't been um, really something anyone was pursuing. So they migrated into the peripheral industry. So heat exchange and seawater AC. So this, you know, it was the first grid connected OTEC plant um, ever. Uh, it was the, it's the only one in the world that's grid connected. Uh, and so they were testing their heat exchangers for use in the F-35s, you know, the new the fancy, new, awesome planes. Um, once that testing was done, a Rankin, there, there, there's nothing to test with the OTEC. It's, there's not the tech, unlike other, you know, technology, there's not the technological risk. Uh, I think you were alluding to that. There's not the same technological risk that you have with, say, you know, rockets, rocket, um, you know, rocket science. Um, but uh, so what we want to do is we want to raise an initial seed round to restart that renewable energy plant and do a full scale integration with the 100 kW. You know, you're essentially show that we can get down to a PUE of, of one, um, which would be a huge feat. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you generate a PDF press release saying, oh, Bitcoin mining is restarting push for renewable energy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and on the back of that, we can raise, uh, do a Series A to build uh, a containerized version. It's about 250 kW in a single container coupled with 250 kW of ASICs um, that, you know, we can use to test that. We can use for, uh, you know, essentially a prototype to scale it up to the the 10 megawatt, you know, test it at 250 kW, and then we can scale that up to um, to 10 megawatts. So that a 10 megawatt would be our Series B, uh, and then from there, you know, once we, you know, there's proof points along the way, you know, you show that show that it works at each point, you do a raise to build the next point, and then you get, you know, containerized 10 megawatt OTEC. Uh, product that you can then, you know, deploy on islands around the world. You can deploy on, um, you know, for for manganese nodule mining or just for mining in the middle of the ocean. Um, you know, that's a viable use case. Uh, and you're proving out the technology all along the way. And you know, taking this thing, it's been around forever. Finally, getting it to scale to where we can, you know provide renewable energy, zero carbon source of energy to uh, around a billion people. But that's a long, long way off. And you, you know, you do all the research along the way. I have connections here at UH where Sea Grant University, um, you know, I've done research myself uh, with UH. And so they're interested in if we can get to 10 megawatts and go out there in the middle of the ocean, there are half a dozen research projects, you know, PhDs are coming out of this um, yeah. and you, you know, show it at scale. You just prove out the technology, um, figure out the kinks along the way. Yeah. I don't really know how to close this podcast because it's not what I expected. Did not expect to learn the word uh, manganese <laughs> nodules, which I was going to say one more time because I'm really enjoying it. Uh, but I want to thank you so much, Nate, for coming on the podcast and we'll have to have you back on again soon to talk about progress as you get through the seed round and, and hopefully later to deploying this. We'll also have to get some videos from you. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can come out to Hawaii sometime. That'd be, we can go scuba diving together. You can show me a few tricks. I guess one yeah. thing we didn't even mention was, uh, jurisdictional arbitrage for the middle of the ocean. Um, oh Yeah. I tweeted yeah. about that the other day. International waters. There you go. <laughs> you know, you can pick and choose what jurisdiction, you know, whatever flag you're flying. Um, yeah. So you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, what you guys are, what's happening with you guys. Like, I mean, it's a mm -hmm. terrible situation, but you don't mm -hmm. have that same concerns. And of course, there's the um, the opportunity for seasteading, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the seasteading movement is large mm -hmm. in the community. And again, they don't have a viable power source. 
uh, to, to go live in the middle oh, of the yeah. ocean. So yeah. this can provide a viable power source for that. Um, so yeah. you could, you know, the Citadel, right? <laughs> <laughs> the Bitcoin <laughs> Citadel. Yeah. Powered by OTEC. Uh, Nate, where can we find you uh, on Twitter? Do you have a website or a blog or anything? Sure. Uh, yeah. So Twitter, we are at blockchain HI one, uh, the number one. Um, and yeah, the BSH website is for other things. So and we're working on um, yeah, just Twitter. Twitter is the best way. Twitter, like everybody else. Okay, yeah. cool. 